<clears throat> I'm going to receive that and pretend like you weren't just prompted to do that. How about that? <laughs> We are continuing on with our uh, series called Equipped and Mature. We started again talking about being a sent people, being a faithful people, being a storytelling people, and now a caring people. Now, this is vitally important. It always has been really important, but it's even more so. Over the last two years, I don't know, we've had, if you've been aware of it, there's been some disruptions in life. And uh, one of those disruptions early on, I remember when the orders first came through and we were told to shelter in place for two weeks, right? Stay home, stay safe, two weeks to flatten the curve. We were holed up in our house in Michigan. And it, it changed a lot of things. And at first it was kind of fun. Like at first we we're like, I get to work from home. Everybody was excited about that. Oh, we get to do the meetings through Zoom. I can pretend that I have to go to the bathroom and just turn off my camera and just do whatever I want to do. Just kidding. That didn't actually happen. Lots of integrity. It was kind of fun at first until it went on and then two weeks became two more weeks, which became two more weeks and it just seemed like it would never end. And all sorts of things suffered in the process of that. Uh, one of the things that changed for us is we were still doing foster care at the, at the time. We hadn't closed our adoption on our youngest daughter. And uh, one of our significant pieces of that ministry was also to the uh, uh, caseworkers and to the case aides and the managers at our foster care agency. And oftentimes, uh, you know, Janine actually did a 95% a of this, but oftentimes when those uh, workers would come over to our house for a meeting, they would stick around for coffee and maybe talk a little bit personally about their life. On occasion, we'd get to pray for them. And it was just a really, really good time of ministering to people in that sense in a, in a field where people are burning out, right? It's a, it's a fast turnover rate in the foster care system all over the country. It doesn't really matter what state you are in. And it was no different for those caseworkers. And so we would find ways to encourage them. And then when we had the lockdown, Things shifted. Uh, the meetings weren't happening in our home anymore, and they were happening uh, through Zoom, or the parent visits weren't happening as much anymore uh, alive. They were happening through Zoom. Even court cases, right, were shut down. But we still had this heart to make sure that we check in on the people that we were involved with. And, and my wife, Janine, had a fair amount of influence with, with the agency, and, and we had just a lot of favor there. And so she wanted to continue on with encouraging some of the workers. So she would make sure that she would call them and see how they were doing personally. And one of the conversations stood out to me in particular. Our caseworker for Isla, before her adoption, is a mid-20s living on her own person. And she was, she was a wonderful caseworker and Janine would uh, call to check in on her. And so she called to check in on her as the lockdown was now going well beyond two weeks. And she said, how are you doing? And her response is what stuck with me. She said, well, I'm not staying at home and I'm not staying safe. She said, my mom actually has a really hard time with me not staying at home, but I had to tell her mom, listen, I live alone. I already struggle with mental health. I promise you it is either go and be with my friends for the sake of my mental health or kill myself. Now her language might seem a little bit extreme, right? But she was not kidding. For her, it was one of those two options. I either need to be in relationship with people or life doesn't seem worth living. Mental health over the course of the pandemic it seemed to be exacerbated. It just took problems that were already there and just magnified them beyond belief. Why? Six feet apart, please. There's a guy named Edward T. Hall, and in the 1950s, he put out a paper. Edward T. Hall was a sociologist and he did some studies. And in, in 1950, he put out a paper on a, a, a term that he had coined called proxemics. Proxemics is the study of how close you and I are in proximity to one another, the space that we share and the effect that that has not only on relationship, but on systems and structures and on all society. And so Hall, uh, in coining the term proxemics, defined four uh, essential spaces. Uh, the first space is what he called the public space. 
Now, the public space represents, um, and, and you can see it potentially, the, the public space represents uh, between 10 to 25 uh, feet away, and, and everybody that's included in that, and it can even be farther than that, and it is usually 75 plus people. So over 75 people included in your public space. Here where we are right now would be an example of public space. In public space, people are oftentimes uh, gathered around a shared resource in this case, for good or bad, I'm your shared resource, okay? That's public space. Uh, the next sector we have is called social space. On average, social space is around six to eight feet, okay? It can go as, as great as 12 feet away from you and as close as four. Social space is interesting because social space is the place where we start to find our identity within a group of people. Social space is limited to about 20 to 50 or 60 people. And it's where relationships start to get formed. Not only do we find our identity, not only do we start to find belonging in the social space uh, distance uh, uh, in proximity to other people, but we also start to build relationships. It's, it's close enough that you can start to be known, but kind of far enough away that you can maintain a sense of anonymity. If you choose, you could watch what's going on in a community and not have to be engaged. But should you choose to engage, that's welcome as well. After social space... Uh, Hall has defined something called personal space. This is right around uh, two to four feet. And this is where uh, relationships start to pick up a little bit of steam. This is where you can really uh, be known. This is where uh, relationships develop to the point where they gain intimacy and you can't fit as many people in there anymore. Not only are you uh, approximately you know, four to six feet away from me, but you are also uh, limited in how many people can fit within that space. So if you were to gather a circle of people around you at that distance, at most, you might be able to fit about 12 people, right? That's about how many people we could actually build significant and, and start to gain intimacy within relationship. And then uh, finally, uh, Hall defines the intimate space, which is about one and a half feet away from you. It's kind of that hugging space. It's where love and intimacy really finds its home. It's the person that you will absolutely be emotionally naked with right? This is, this is the relationship of love. This is my wife. These are my kids. Not many people can inhabit that one and a half feet of space with me. See, we reserve it for the closest of spaces. Now, what's interesting is uh, social and personal space is that belonging space. It's that space that we begin to build relationships and we build up more relationship and gain, begin intimacy with each other. And the interesting thing is over the last two years, this is the main space that we've lost. Now we lost the public space as well, but public space can't do what public space can't do. By that, I mean public space can't really begin to build relationship. You gather 75 plus people together and now you are at an event. You think, you think concerts and you think uh, shopping, places of shopping, the literal public spaces that we go out into, right? We're not there to build relationship. We're there to gather around shared resources and that can be very, very good. Yes, we lost that, but that's not really the place we find our belonging. When we were told to stand more than six feet apart, we lost a significant uh, space of belonging and intimacy and relationship. And here's the truth. You and I are created for intimacy. You and I are created to belong. It's in that space that we find care for. Why did mental health take such a big hit over the pandemic? Because we lost the space within which we find a release, we find intimacy, we find being known, and that matters. For a long time in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, there was a push in psychology around what, uh, what became to be known as just um, self-esteem. <laughs> Everything was self-esteem. And over the time, they've decided that self-esteem matters less. And actually, this social and personal space uh, matters more. In 1995, a guy named Roy Baumeister at Florida State published a substantial article on this. In this, he debunked self-esteem and he started talking more about belonging. And through his study, he found that what mattered more than how you felt about yourself was, do you understand where you belong? 
Belonging in a group of people, being known and cared for by others, mattered more than how you felt about yourself. Actually, how you felt about yourself was more influenced by that than how people told you you are good at things. We were created for community. This matters. Friends, you and I are called to be a people who create this kind of space. In order to do that, I want to invite you to look at John chapter 10 with me. We're going to look at the ultimate source of belonging, the ultimate source of being known. John chapter 10, we're going to start at verse 11 and read on from there. Here Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flocks and the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he is a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Just as my father knows me and I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Friends, this is our understanding of how we create space, but let's dive into it. Now, Jesus is talking to the religious elite, specifically the Pharisees have been giving Jesus a hard time. And so he's been talking to them. And now he starts talking to them about them. <laughs> he starts talking to the Pharisees, but kind of in this metaphor language where he's now talking about the Pharisees. And in doing so, he says, I am the good shepherd. Now, the good shepherd uh, matters because what Jesus is doing here when he says, I'm the good shepherd, uh, I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus is doing something significant now, and he's doing so publicly. He's, he's taking the past and the future, and he's tying it into the now. You see, for centuries, uh, there had been prophecies. God had spoken through the prophets to say, there is going to be a scattering of the unfaithful Israel. Because that's who Jesus is talking about. That's the metaphor here. When Jesus talks about sheeps and shepherding, he's talking about himself and he's talking about Israel. And for centuries, uh, God had spoken through the prophets saying, listen, unfaithful Israel, you're like these sheep that wander away. And one day I'm just gonna give you the desires of your heart. I'm gonna let you wander. But then after that, I'm going to gather you back. I will send a good, a true and better shepherd to gather you back together. And so Jesus takes these past prophecies and he brings them into the present. He says, I am the fulfillment of that. I am the good shepherd. And the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus speaks of what he will do. What will happen in the person of Jesus. Now he takes past and future and brings them into the present. And he says, it's in the place, this place of Jesus, who is the good shepherd. The, shepherd, the good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. Verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep. So when he sees the wolf coming, he abandons the sheep and runs away. Then the wolf attacks the flock and scatters it. The man runs away because he has a hired hand and cares nothing for the sheep. Now here's where Jesus starts to get a little bit, a little bit confrontational with the religious leaders. You see, this metaphor has been known by Israel for a long time. They've heard the metaphor of shepherding. They understand it. Uh, they get, maybe shepherds aren't the people you want to spend the most time around. They're stinky and they spend a lot of time out in the rain and the elements. And they're just really rough individuals. They're not very refined, right? Education isn't their first priority. So they get, they get what shepherding is. And now Jesus kind of turns this metaphor where he says, I'm the good shepherd. And he starts talking directly about the Pharisees, directly about the Sadducees, directly about the scribes and the religious leaders, the priests, those who have been in place and in leadership. And he refers to them as hired hands. 
He says, listen, you all have been like these hired hands. And when there's a hired hand, they don't really care significantly for the sheep. To them, it's just a job. Their livelihood is not necessarily uh, wrapped up in it. They don't know the sheep intimately. They're just there to kind of, you know, make sure that things are going on. But when push comes to shove, when things start to get a little bit dangerous, the hired hand runs away. He doesn't care for the sheep the way the good shepherd cares for the sheep. And so when the wolf or when the bear or when whatever comes along and uh, starts to apply pressure and, and there's actual sacrifice re- required from the shepherd, the hired hand just gets up and runs away out of fear. But then Jesus reiterates in verse 14, I am the good shepherd. Jesus compares himself now with the religious leaders and he says, they are the hired hands, but I, again, he, he reiterates that I am the good shepherd. And as the hired hand just gets up and runs away, they don't know the sheep. They don't have the same intimacy. They don't have the same care. Uh, I'm the good shepherd and I know my sheep and my sheep know me. Jesus is not just talking about knowing his sheep in terms of knowing what they look like and how many of them are. This is not just data collection for Jesus. This word that's used for know is a word of intimacy. It would be the same word that is used for a husband knowing his wife in intimacy. Jesus is is pointing out something significant here. It's not just knowing about the sheep. It's truly knowing the sheep. The good shepherd knows his sheep. And if that's not enough, he actually qualifies it in verse 15. Just as the father knows me and I know the father and I lay my life down for the sheep. Jesus qualifies this knowing with the sheep, not just by saying, I know I'm intimate uh, with these sheep that is Israel. Uh, he, he's now taking it a step further and saying, I know Israel, I know my people, and they know me. Those who actually follow after me, we have this intimacy, but it's not just an intimacy that this world knows. It's a different intimacy. In fact, it could be best understood by talking about the relationship that the father has with the son. Jesus is starting to talk about this Trinitarian relationship now. He's starting to talk about this this love relationship that has been going on for all eternity past and will continue on for all eternity future. The thing that Jesus had with the Father before the foundation of the world was set in place. Jesus says, as we knew each other in that relationship, I know my sheep. What Jesus is doing here is he's, he's creating a verbal space for the most intimate possible relationship there is. Jesus is inviting those who follow him to be one with him and the Father. Not one metaphorically, but to be truly one in unity, unified to one another. Later on in John, he prays for this unity. He says, Father, let them be one and us in one the way we have been one since the beginning of the world. Jesus is inviting those who follow him into Trinitarian relationship. This is significant. It's beautiful, but he takes it one step further. Going on to verse 15. Uh, Sorry, verse 16, he says, And I have other sheep that are not of this sheep pen. I must bring them also. They too will listen to my voice, and there shall be one flock and one shepherd. Now, this is where Jesus starts to even get more offensive, because up until now, Jesus has been talking about the shepherding, and he's already offended the Pharisees and the other leaders. But now he offends them again because he does the unthinkable. Up until now, he's only been talking about Israel as his sheep. And now he turns the analogy, he turns the metaphor and he says, I have other sheep as well. Well, his hearers would have immediately understood Gentiles. Because if they're not of our sheep pen, if they're not of the flock of Israel, if they're not of of the tribe of Abraham, then they are outside of that family. They are outside of the lineage of Israel. They are Gentile. And, And every good Jew knew that you don't associate, you don't even talk to, you don't go into the house of a Gentile. But here Jesus says, I have other sheep, sheep that are not part of Israel. And I have to gather them as well. And so the mission of Israel being fulfilled in the person of Jesus is now extended to the entire world. 
And what's more is Jesus is now defining who is in the family of God. Jesus is saying that I take sheep from this pen and I take sheep from this pen and I'm going to bring them both out and I am going to create space for them to be cared for in green pasture. It is no longer what family you come from. It now matters which shepherd you follow. It no longer matters what your nationality is or what your lineage is or what you can record throughout history. It now matters who is the shepherd that you are following. These are the people that Jesus, as the good shepherd, will gather together and he will create space for them. You see, it was the shepherd's job to bring the sheep out of the pen and bring them into green pastures, into grazing ground to find water. Because I don't know if you've seen some of the videos floating around, but there's some phenomenal ones about sheep just jumping to the ditches. They pull them back out and that sheep goes right back into the ditch, head first. It's hilarious. They need shepherds, right? They need somebody to pull them out of those ditches again and again and again and bring them to the place. Jesus continues on after he talks about bringing the Gentiles into his flock into that kind of space creation. And he says this, they too hear my voice. Well, first and foremost, this is defining community around Jesus. But secondly, there's something significant here as we stick with this shepherding metaphor. Not only was it the shepherd's job to create this caring space, this, this place for, um, for food and water and all of the needs of the flock, the shepherd would also speak to his sheep to direct them out beyond that. They would have to go to other grazing grounds and, and the sheep would have to follow him and the shepherd could just command them by his voice, at least if they knew the shepherd. The hired hand, maybe not so much, but the good, true shepherd, yes, that one, he knew their voice. There was an intimacy I used to spend some time around horses um, doing some weird stuff like stunt riding and weird stuff like that. But um, it was phenomenal because we could like talk to the horse and pet the horse and everything. But that was just kind of like on this weekly basis. And then we'd put the horse away. And, and sometimes it wasn't very easy to get the horse to, to obey you. But my aunt who owned the horses, she had a different kind of a relationship with them. One of the horses that we used for vaulting was called Bunny, and Bunny was a huge horse, right? Beautiful, muscular horse. And she'd be on the other side of the barn, and uh, my aunt would say, Bunny, come here. Her ears would go up, and she'd just trot right forward to my Aunt Karen, and they would just have like this, this relationship, and she'd pet her, and they'd give each other like weird horse snuggles or something. I don't know. Right? They, they knew each other's voice, and Jesus says there's, there's that Yes, but also there's the correction side of my voice. You see, because a good shepherd doesn't just know his, know his sheep in intimacy, he also uh, commands his sheep and at times corrects his sheep. Correction is a huge thing because otherwise uh, we as people, we just scatter. Like we just, we go do our own thing time and time again as you read the Old Testament. And this, uh, this metaphor of sheep and shepherding comes up. It it's always has to do with the sheep going astray. It's like Jesus is saying, listen, you have all constantly just forgotten to listen to my voice, but even these other sheep, this, this new flock that's coming together, not just Israel, but also of Gentiles, it's gonna be gathered around understanding my voice and not just the good part of my voice, but the, the rough part of my voice, the correction part of my voice, the fierce part of who I am as a shepherd. All of those things together are involved in this metaphor of creating this caring space for the sheep. Because without the challenge, without the correction part of the shepherd, these sheep would just scatter and they would just go do whatever they need to, whatever they felt like doing. They'd jump into ditches and they'd go off and they present themselves as food to other predators. But Jesus says, these sheep, these know my voice. They're a, a, a group that's gathered around this. What Jesus is actually saying is he's saying he's willing to create space. And this is what was just absolutely horrendous for all of Israel. Jesus was willing to create space for anybody that would now organize around himself, around his voice, around his commands, around himself revealing God the Father. And in that, we learn a valuable lesson about being a caring church. We learn that the shepherding church creates space for all who would seek Jesus. 
The shepherding church creates space for all who would seek Jesus. Here's the thing. Israel found this absolutely horrendous because they were the insiders. They had gotten really used to being the in crowd and they were the privileged and that they were the blessed ones of God. Anything outside of that is preposterous. We can't possibly talk about Gentiles. Friends, it's not much different for us. Only it, it looks a little bit more noble at times and it looks a lot more well-intentioned, but it sounds a little bit more like this. But what about me? But I've been here for a long time. Friends, there's a challenge in this for us that as a shepherding church, we can't, we can't do what Israel did and say, but what about me? Because if we have this attitude of what about me, we won't create space for all who would seek Jesus. If we have this what about me understanding, and, and but I've been here for a long time understanding, we will never create space for those who are entering into the family of God. We won't be able to think beyond ourselves. Here's the reality. Some of us have grown up in church and we've been cared for for a very long time. And it's very important that we are all cared for, but some of us now need to turn our attention to being those who create space for new people who are following Jesus. I was sitting in an elder meeting at a previous church and I remember uh, we had invited one of the founders of this church uh, about 30 years ago, the church had, had started. And um, he said, you know what, we started this church for a very important reason. We realized that we were now in our mid, mid 40s and we had been cared for our entire lives. We realized something. We don't want to be a, a part of a church that just cares for me. It's my turn now to create space for other people. It's now my turn to be the one to say, it's not about me anymore. I'm going to be the shepherding presence that creates space for other people now. What I have received, now I'm going to pass on. Freely you have received, now freely you give. Is, is all this starting to click? Friends, you and I are to be the people that create space for others. We are to be the shepherding presence in the world for anybody who would choose to even be interested in the person of Jesus or even start to like the things that they hear about what's going on in your life. You and I are called to be a people who open up the, the four to 12 feet of distance in our lives for other people to gather around it and start to taste and see that the Lord is good. You and I are called to be a people who, who make that space for other people to enter into so that they too can start hearing the voice of God in whatever capacity they can. You and I are called to be the people who care for others and it doesn't matter how long you've been in the family or how long you haven't been in the family. Are you seeking the Lord? Let's start creating space for you. Are you interested in hearing about it? Let's start creating space for you. This is what matters. This is what it means to be a caring church. So what does that look like? First, it looks like sacrificing for the flock. If we're going to be a shepherding church, if we're going to be a, a caring people, then first that requires sacrifice for the flock. Just as the good shepherd said he was the good shepherd because he lays down his life for the sheep, you and I are called to lay our lives down for other people. Time and time again, Jesus said, if you've seen me do it, you have to do it. As I've served you, you serve others. Jesus lived sacrificially and he gave his life sacrificially. And you and I are called to sacrifice for the sheep. We're called to sacrifice on behalf of one another. And we're called to sacrifice for those that we uh, rub elbows with every single day. Anybody who might want to come in and taste and see, we need to create space for them. Sacrificial living is one of the main goals we have as a church. And as God is putting people together in families, God is the one who puts the lonely in families. And as he does that, we are called to lay our lives down for one another. That means emotionally, that means relationally, and yes, that means financially. That's what we're called to do. That's what it means to live sacrificially in relationship with one another. 
So first, we have to live sacrificially. We have to sacrifice for the flock. And then the second thing we see as Jesus is talking, and just as he did, we have to welcome the new sheep. We have to be people who are welcoming to the new sheep. Again, Israel got stuck on believing that they deserved something special because they had always been a part of the family. And Jesus comes in and he says, that is good. You do need space. They need space too. We don't get our space at the expense of other people's space. And the space, friends, just really clearly is not just here. What we experience here is that public space. This is that space where we gather around shared resources and there is a small level of getting to know each other. But if you push beyond that too far, if you try to become too intimate in public space, you've broken the rules of proxemics and we feel that. We need to be a people who aren't just creating space in here, but creating space in that social and in those personal distances in our lives. When Janine and I started here, uh, at the end of last year, we did our best <laughs> to, to fill our schedule with having people over to dinner. And it seemed like maybe three or four nights a week sometimes we were having people over for dinner at our house. And we had a list of people. And honestly, as somebody, like we weren't expecting new people at first. If we're, if we're being honest, like when we got here, we weren't expecting a bunch of new people to show up, but that happened. And so we were trying to bring them in as well and explain where we're going as a church. And it only took a few months and Janine and I realized we cannot do this anymore. We can't. We cannot be the ones that bring people into our, our personal and our social space at that pace. It's just not going to be good for us. It's not going to be good for our families. And quite honestly, we weren't paying attention to the rules of proxemics, which means that we can, in our personal space, only have about 12 people. After that, you start to lose intimacy. After that, you start to lose capacity to care for other people. And friends, I've said this before, but shepherding is one of my least strong qualities. That doesn't mean that I can't do it. It doesn't mean that I don't get out of it. It just means that I have to work harder at it than maybe some of you have to. Some of you are really good at creating space within your personal and your social spheres than, than I am, and, and we need you. But here's the takeaway, friends. I can't be the one who creates personal space for everybody. I don't have that capacity. My challenge to you is as you are living sacrificially, sacrificing for the flock, that you create space for new people. I don't just mean in here, I mean in your everyday lives. And then finally, we have to challenge forward. Right? The sheep know the shepherd's voice. When we create space for people, we are creating a space that is ripe for discipleship. Each space that we talked about has a unique gift to give those within it for discipleship. And when we are creating space in our personal and in our social spheres for other people to enter in, what we are giving them is access to our lives. And as followers of Jesus, that is the start of discipleship. Beautiful things can happen, and a big piece of discipleship is challenge. You may have found it in your own life, but when you have somebody uh, that has come around and you challenge them in their beliefs or you challenge them in their living, if you don't have enough, uh, if you don't have enough relational capital with that person, it just it doesn't go well. But if you've brought them in, if you've made the space and you've built that relationship, then challenge can be accepted. And people, when challenge is accepted in caring relationship, can grow and become what God has called them to be. When we're creating space for people, I'm not asking you to create another social club. I'm not asking you to create another friend group. I've said for a while in previous contexts, here's the truth, friends. I'm sorry. I don't need more friends. I need more people who are willing to step into a relationship with God and help other people step into their discipling relationship with God. I need people who are willing to say yes to hearing the shepherd's voice and going in the same direction. When we do that, we create beautiful, caring, and friendly places, but it has to start from a place of intentionality. It has to start from this place of challenging forward, follow Jesus. That's what happens when we create these spaces. 
If you and I want to be a caring church, it's not going to be a church that is just cozy. If you and I want to create caring spaces, it's not just another social time. If you and I want to create caring spaces, it's where people are known, yes, cared for, loved, but also challenged. It is very unloving to leave people where they are. As a shepherding church, we help challenge people forward. Friends, I think this might be the greatest need in our culture today. Ray and Carol were just talking to us a little bit about <laughs> how they've had to take a lot of extra time and that, that the truth of the word and that the grace found in relationship creates this space where now that they have, they have something that they can build, they have something that they can build out and people are entering in and they want to stick around for the relationship. It's an intentional relationship where people are being confronted and challenged with the truth of scripture. It's not just cozy. That's the space we want to create. But here's the challenge. It can't just be here. This is not enough. This will continue to grow. This will continue to become increasingly anonymous. There is, however, beautiful space that you and I can create in our lives. But I can't do it for you. I want to ask you, do you have this burden? Do you feel that? Some of you have felt like, I don't know if I have community. I'm asking you to consider if maybe God's calling you to create community. Not another social club, but an intentional discipleship community. Maybe he's calling you to do that, but I can't do it for you. Author Joseph R. Myers, writing about the public and social, private space, personal space, he had this to say about moving people through the spaces. Let people move themselves. Don't insist on doing it for them. Friends, I can't do it for you. I can't create your community for you. I promise you, I will let you down. I promise you. It's not an if, it's a when. If you are waiting for me to create community for you, I can't do that because a key aspect is people saying, come on, I will challenge you forward. I will live sacrificially. I can't live sacrificially on your behalf. I can't challenge forward on your behalf. I can't make space in your personal life. Only you can. You have to take that step. I can help you. I can coach you. I can encourage you. But you have to take that step. You have to create the place. Can we be a people at a time when it is more necessary than ever in our world? Can we be a people who start creating that space for people who might want to start tasting and seeing that God is good? There are people around you every single day. They're your neighbors and they're your coworkers. Some of them are even your family members. Let's be that people. Let's pray.